Good afternoon, and welcome to our weekly research and action series brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Jeannie Viviani, and I will be today's moderator. Dr. Michael McCoy received his BS and MS degrees from Old Dominion University and has a PhD from the University of Florida. He then went on to do postdocs at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama and the University of South Florida and the University of Florida. Dr. McCoy was hired by the Department of Biology at East Carolina University in the fall of 2012 and was promoted as associate professor in 2018. He remained at East Carolina until the fall of 2021 when he joined the faculty at FAU. While most of Dr. McCoy's research until the fall research has focused on species <laughs> interactions, he has a diverse research dossier that spans from tropical to temperate biomes and includes research in terrestrial freshwater and marine ecosystems. Dr. McCoy has over 60 peer reviewed publication has been, and has been awarded over a million dollars in grants to support his research. Mike, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me get my presentation shared here and we'll get started. Okay. So today I'm going to tell you about the ecological roles of predators and um, and in some sense how we study them. And so often people ask me, you know, why do you study predation? What is interesting about predation? And my answer is often, you know, sort of to point out that predation is just intrinsically interesting and fascinating. And most people, I think, are fascinated by predation and predators. And this is sort of uh, illustrated by whenever you encounter a new animal, one of the first questions we ask ourselves is, what does it eat? And that question is sort of ingrained in us from a very early age. So just a quick Google search of children's books, and you will find, you know, dozens of books like these ones that I've sort of haphazardly selected here. And they're all sort of focused on what does it eat? So we ask this question about what things eat and, and are kind of interested in predators from you know, our earliest moments. And that fascination doesn't end in our childhood, right? If we watch nature documentaries, we'll see almost all of them are in some way about consumer resource dynamics, who eats who, right? And this is in part, I think that fascination because predation is really dramatic, whether it's the sort of thrill of the hunt and the disappointment of a failed uh, predation event, or the majesty of a successful one, or kind of a, you know, the sort of unexpected shock event that happens in predation, it sort of captures our attention and, and nature documentaries tend to uh, exploit that to sort of get our viewership. But there's another sort of component of predation that I think uh, underlies our fascination with it. And that is sort of an anxiety about whether or not we might actually be prey. And you can see this throughout, you know, numerous um, works of literature and, and, and movies and TV shows where so often the subject matter of those um, artistic works are what if a predator sort of focused on humans as prey. But sort of beyond the sort of pop culture interest in predators, I think we're also interested in predators because they're sort of a uh, there's an intuitive understanding of how important they are for food webs, and in particular, how they structure food webs and ecosystems. And this intuition was formalized by this now classic paper that was published back in 1960. Um, and this paper uh, has now kind of become known as why the world is green hypothesis. And basically, these three authors set out to answer the question, why is the world green? And they came to a pretty... Uh, straightforward conclusion after some amount of debate. And that is that herbivores don't eat all of the plants that make the world green because there are predators around to keep their numbers in check. And while this might seem very simple at the time, most ecologists thought that um, systems were, were regulated by the availability of resources at the bottom of food webs. And this sort of turned that on their head and said, actually food webs are regulated by the presence of predators at the top of food webs. And this launched a whole subgenre of ecological research. And so the basic idea of that paper led to this idea of what we call now a trophic cascade. And a trophic cascade is just 
a scenario where if you don't have a predator in a system, herbivores can eat unchecked and reproduce and their populations grow and that reduces the availability of their resource, which is plants most of the time. But if you introduce a predator to the system, it predates and removes some of those herbivores, in this case deer, and in so doing allows the plants to flourish and reproduce and grow in their population numbers. And so through this cascade where predators reduce the number of their prey, which then increases the availability of plants, predators have this effect that cascades across trophic levels or through the food web. And that's indicated here by these dashed lines, which are called indirect effects. And in this case, the predator has an indirect positive effect on the plants by reducing the number of deer feeding on them. And the plants have an indirect positive effect on the predator by providing food for the predator's resource, the prey. But I will point out here that predators can affect food webs in more ways than just by eating their prey. They can also have the same effects on a food web by just being present in the system and scaring the prey. So in this case, I've tried to indicate that this predator enters the system and all the deer go to a different area to forage because they can smell or detect the predators present. And that behavioral change in the prey can have the same impact on the plants and create this terrific cascade. Now, I showed a relatively simple three-level food chain there to illustrate trophic cascades, but it's important to note that these can actually be incredibly complex networks of interactions where the predator's effects can cascade through lots of channels to affect the structure of food webs. And these kinds of uh, predator effects are present both in terrestrial systems and in aquatic systems. And in some cases, the predator's effects can actually transcend those ecosystem boundaries where an aquatic predator might affect a terrestrial predator, uh, a terrestrial food web. And so that's going to be the first study I want to tell you about um, from work that I've done in the past. And that is a study that sort of focused on the idea that complex life cycles can create avenues for these kinds of trophic cascades across ecosystem boundaries. And in this case, a complex life cycle just describes a scenario where an animal might go through different developmental stages, like in a frog, it goes from a tadpole to a frog. And in a dragonfly's case, it goes from an underwater predatory nymph into an adult flying dragonfly. And so this complex life cycle crosses the land water interface as it goes through its, um, completes its uh, development. And so in this study, we were focused on trying to understand uh, how this trophic cascade, which was really well known in pond systems, in which uh, fish eat large invertebrate predators like this dragonfly nymph, which then increases the abundance of smaller um, invertebrates like zooplankton or other kinds of insects like mayflies. And in the same system, but on the land surrounding those ponds, we can have another kind of trophic cascade. And note in this case, we have a dragonfly adult predator that is uh, depredating on pollinators, in this case, a bee. And since pollinators have a synergistic or positive effect on their resource, plants, in this case, we have a different kind of trophic cascade where the predators can negatively affect plants by uh, removing its mutualist. But in this case, in this particular system, we were interested in this uh, studying uh, the effects of fish on plants because this dragonfly predator in the aquatic environment and this dragonfly predator in the terrestrial environment are the same species. And so these two um, food webs are linked together through that species completing its life cycle. And so how do we go about answering that question? Well, we went to this location that's in uh, Northern Florida, it's called the uh, Ordway Swisher Preserve. And we identified four lakes that contained fish based on lots of prior research that we were doing in the area and four fish that, uh, I mean, four lakes that contained fish and four that did not have fish indicated here by red and blue. Then at each one of those lakes, we went out and we did a survey. First, we tested whether or not there was a difference in the number of dragonflies in ponds that had fish versus those that didn't. And here we can see the results of those surveys. And the first result that you should focus in on is that the total number of dragonflies in the no fish ponds was much greater than in the fish ponds. And the second thing to note here is that the 
the composition of those dragonflies changed towards smaller species in the presence of fish versus those that were in no fish ponds. So there were larger and more dragonflies at no fish ponds. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a change in the number of adult dragonflies at those sites. So we also did surveys of the adult dragonflies swimming around those ponds, and we found basically the same result, right? At the ponds that did not have fish in them, there were more larger dragonfly species than at ponds that had fish. So the fish were affecting the number of adult dragonflies. And just to confirm that, this graph just shows that the number of dragonflies in the pond, the, the larval phase, um, predicted the number that were adults. So that sort of solidifies that link between fish and adult dragonflies. However, did this affect pollinators? Well, to determine that, we went out and did pollinator surveys and just counted the number of pollinators visiting a native plant, Hypericum physicalatum, that grows naturally around the mar margins of these ponds. And here we can see a similar kind of graph where in the no fish ponds, there were very few pollinators visiting those flowers relative to the, the plants that were growing around ponds that did have fish in them. And there was also, again, a shift in the type of pollinators as well. So fewer bees, for example, at no fish ponds. And in fact, this reduction in the visitation by pollinators resulted in greater pollen limitation. So pollen limitation just means the plants weren't getting enough pollen delivered to them to produce as many seeds as they could. And so we see here at the flowers growing next to no fish ponds were more pollen limited, i.e. they were not getting fertilized at the same rate as, pond, as the same species of plant growing around ponds with fish. So what we were able to show in this study is that through this sort of complex chain of interactions that fish, by consuming large dragonfly species, we're having a positive effect on reproduction of a terrestrial plant. And this was a really interesting result because it showed how predator effects can cascade across um, ecosystems in unexpected ways to influence um, species interactions that, you, in, in, that are separated in time and space from the predator itself. So that's just sort of one example that, of how predators can have these strong effects in structuring food webs and ecosystems. And so next, I want to go into a little bit of a more technical um, part of my talk to talk about uh, how do we actually quantify predation. So in that first study, we just sort of measured how many prey a predator eats. But often what we really need to know is predation rate, right? How fast do they eat prey? And we know that predation rate isn't really one single value. It's not, it's not constant most of the time. And that's because predation rate can depend on how many prey are available or how dense the prey are. It can also be affected by things like pollution or changes in temperature or uh, environmental conditions. And it can be affected by differences in the sizes of the predators and prey. And so I want to go through and talk about these three things uh, for the remainder of this talk. So first, let's talk about prey availability. How does prey availability affect predation rate? Well, here I've just kind of drawn a cartoon example here of a stone crab that's eating on uh, oysters. And so this stone crab would have a lower predation rate in this low abundance of oysters than it might have in this environment where oysters are super abundant. And the reason for this is because it has to spend a, a larger part of its time seeking out and finding an oyster when the oysters aren't very common than in the environment where the oysters are everywhere. It doesn't have to look for them, it just can just eat them. So their predation rate is density dependent. It depends on the abundance of prey. And back in 1959, a guy named C.S. Holland came up with some mechanistic models that described how predation rate changes as a function of the number of prey that are available in the environment. And he categorized them into three types. The first type here is called a type one functional response. And that's what he called these responses of predators to prey density. And it just describes uh, predation increasing linearly with the number of prey. So if there's more prey in the environment, the predator will eat proportionately more of them. The second type was this nonlinear function that I referred to as a type two functional response. And in this case, we get this sort of leveling off of predation rate because the predator is spending an increasing amount of its time chewing and processing prey it already ate 
um, when it's at high densities relative to looking for new prey. So it's greater proportion of its time is spent um, processing prey. And then a type three functional response, which is very similar to a type two, except that it suggests that predators aren't consuming prey when they're very uncommon, either because they're too hard to find or they're not energetically uh, profitable enough. So, so what we did in, in this next study I wanna tell you about is we went, uh, wanted to quantify the shape of the functional response for this stone crab predator that was feeding on oysters. And so the way you do these experiments is you might uh, put the predator into an aquarium or some kind of uh, experimental arena with different numbers of prey available. And then you just count based on how many prey were available, how many they consumed in a given period of time. And that allows you to draw this curve and determine the shape of the functional response. Now, that by itself is an interesting thing to know, but you can actually then use this mechanistic description of predator foraging rate to answer important questions about how environmental factors might be affecting um, these ecological interactions. So in this case, we were really interested in um, how increasing salinity associated with climate change effects on sea level rise and uh, uh, outflow of fresh water into estuaries in North Carolina. And the reason we were interested in this is because we're seeing an increase in salinity in many of those estuaries where oysters have been the dominant filter feeders for, for uh, millennia. And with that increasing salinity, they're getting an increasing abundance of this kind of sponge, Cleonia, which um, produces a chemical which erodes the shells of the oysters. Now, this is bad for the oysters because it potentially weakens their shell, but it also is bad for oyster fishermen because that makes the, the, the oysters less um, uh, desirable for consumers. And another thing about the system is because of rising temperatures, stone crabs are becoming increasingly common in this area, which is at the northern limit of their range. So we're interested in how these climate change effects were changing this interaction. And so what we did is we ran that functional response experiment by offering the crabs different densities of oysters. But in one set of trials, those oysters were infected with that sponge that was just messing up their shells. And we were interested in whether that changed the foraging rate of the crabs. And so remember, this is a type two functional response, which is the one that described um, predation for this system. And it has got two important parameters that describe uh, this function. The first is attack rate. And that simply describes how predation rate increases with increasing prey availability um, at low density. And then this handling time parameter, which basically sets the maximum feeding rate for a predator. So it says how many, how many prey can a predator eat per day um, at its maximum rate. And so now we can compare functional responses from those uh, two different kinds of oysters, those with sponges and those without sponges. And here what we can see is that um, there was no difference in the attack rate on, on oysters that were infected with the sponge or that had been colonized by the sponge versus those that did not have sponges on them. But there was a difference in the maximum feeding rate on those oysters. And so what we found here is that those oysters that had their shells partially eroded by the sponge um, were the, the crabs were able to eat them much more quickly. So they had a, a lower handling time, which means they could forage on them at a much higher rate. And so this weakening of the shell by the sponge was changing the foraging rate in an important way um, for this particular interaction. Now, I just wanted to say, I'm not gonna present data from this, but with collaborators at FAU, Matt Ajimian and Natalia Jaworski, I'm continuing related work looking at functional responses of other kinds of predators that eat hard shell prey. In this case, uh, focusing on hard clams. And this includes things like spotted eagle rays and checkered pufferfish. So uh, more on that in the future. Okay, so we can now see how predation rate changes with prey availability and how environmental factors might be changing those interactions. Um, and in this case, I was talking about sort of abiotic things like temperature or salinity, but what about things like pollution? And so we did a study a while back looking at how uh, 
what are referred to here as PPCPs, which stands for uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products, might be affecting the interaction between, in this case, this mosquito fish and its prey, which are mosquitoes. And these mosquito fish have been introduced all over the world as a mosquito control mechanism because they live in small ponds of water where mosquitoes tend to breed and they eat a lot of mosquito larvae. But in a lot of these ponds, especially in wastewater treatment plants, there are a huge or high concentrations of pharmaceuticals and personal care products. Um, and this is because things that go into our body and then we excrete and then goes into a wastewater treatment plant eventually make it out of those wastewater treatment plants and back into our waterways. And so uh, substances like caffeine or DEET, which we spray on our clothes as an insect repellent, or triclosan, which is an almost all antibacterial soaps, um, those things end up in our waterways after our water passes through wastewater treatment plants. And these three um, PPCPs are the most frequently detected in most natural systems, and then sometimes, as I said, in really high concentrations. So we were interested in how these predator-prey interactions that we depend on for controlling a pest species like a mosquito might be affected by these chemicals. And so again, we did an experiment with a functional response where we manipulated the density. In this case, we're showing you the larval phase of, phase of mosquitoes, which are aquatic. Um, so we used different densities of mosquitoes and exposed each one to a mosquito fish. But we did that in an environment that had been, uh, had caffeine or D or triclosan or a mixture of all three added to it, uh, mimicking those conditions that are seen in natural wetlands that are contaminated. And here's what we found. Here are the functional responses from those different treatments. And there's not too much you can take away from this because it's a bit of a busy figure, but I'm gonna show you those parameters that are really important for describing this functional response. And that is, remember, the attack rate and handling time. So uh, in this case, this red bar here is representing our control or filtered water treatment. So no chemicals were in the water. And we can see that the mosquito fish, why they are called mosquito fish, they have a relatively high attack rate, meaning they eat a lot of the prey when they're, not, when they're at low densities. And they also have a low handling time, which means that they can have a pretty high maximum feeding rate. However, when we expose them to the chemicals, we see some, uh, potentially worrying effects. In particular, the attack rate, right? So the rate at which they consume prey at low densities goes down and their handling times go up, both of which mean that these fish are eating fewer mosquitoes when environments are contaminated with these chemicals. And that means there's gonna be more adult mosquitoes flying around. And this was even true with DEET, which is a mosquito insect repellent. <laughs> and so in those cases, the usage of DEET is actually increasing the abundance of mosquitoes in these systems. And it, the cis situation got even worse when we looked at the mixtures of all three of those chemicals. And in this case, we see it really greatly reduced the motivation to eat in those prey when they were in uh, complex environments, which are typical of natural systems. So these chemicals that are ubiquitous in our environment can actually be changing the nature of predator-prey interactions. And in some cases, it could be affecting things like the abundance of pest species that we are introducing these predators to help control. Now I'm continuing to do work along these lines. And in this case, uh, I'll tell you work that's currently happening in my lab is focused on looking at the effects of plastic leachates in the environment on predator-prey interactions. In this case, as you can see in this short video on predation by octopuses. And there are a variety of plastics and we've all seen the sort of reports about plastics in our waterways and in our oceans. But what we don't hear as much about is that there's, these plastics are in, uh, embedded with lots of chemicals that leach out into the environment. And some of those chemicals like oleamide are neuroactive chemicals that can affect the behavior of predators and prey. And so we're currently analyzing data from an experiment to look at how those chemicals might affect the interaction between common octopus seen here and their prey species in um, intertidal and shallow water ecosystems. Okay, so we've talked about prey availability, um, temperature and salinity, acidif ocean acidification effects um, and how they can affect predation rates. 
So now I want to move over and talk a little bit about how changes in predator size can affect these interactions or prey size. And for this um, part of my talk, I'm going to transition to the tropics where I worked on this amazing animal, which is the red-eyed tree frog, uh, Agalichnus calidryas. <clears throat> and this frog was really interesting to study because again, we have a system where we can have interactions between predators across ecosystem boundaries that can affect um, the way these systems work. And in this case, this frog is really different from the frogs we have here in Florida and in most of North America in that it doesn't lay its eggs in ponds. It actually lays its eggs up in trees that are around ponds. And so it lays eggs on the underside of leaves where they develop in the open air above the pond until they hatch. And then they drop down into the water to become tadpoles. And that um, development time is usually about four to seven days where they remain in these eggs before hatching and dropping into the water as tadpoles. And then of course they develop in the pond until they turn into a froglet and metamorphose and return to the canopy. Now, the reason we were interested in this particular system is because, oops, excuse me, is because this egg stage of the, of the frog's life cycle is up there hanging on leaves overhanging a pond. And so it's actually subject to predation by a wide variety of predators including snakes and uh, a kind of fly called a frog fly and um, a couple of species of wasps that specifically seek out these egg masses to eat the eggs. However, these tadpoles that are these developing embryos aren't just passive participants in this interaction as you'll see in this video of a snake attacking a clutch of eggs. So each one of these little sets of eyes here is a developing frog embryo. And you can see as the snake attacks this um, clutch of eggs, it's creating all kinds of vibrational um, signals. And this turns out that these uh, developing embryos can detect the vibrational signal, vibrational signatures of a predator, and they can release a hatching gland inside their mouth, which dissolves their egg coat. And you can see even after the predator goes away to swallow its meal, the rest of these uh, embryos will induce themselves to hatch out prematurely and drop into the pond and in that way escape the return of that predator um, so that they can continue their life in the pond environment. So this is a case where the predators, by attacking these eggs, are changing um, the conditions for the predators that are in the pond environment. And they do that in two ways, right? So by attacking those nests, those terrestrial predators like the wasp and the snake, um, reduce the abundance of tadpoles falling into the pond by about half. And they also change the size and developmental stage of those tadpoles. So those that hatch prematurely, as you can see here, still have external gills and they're very small relative to those that it hatched out naturally without a predation event, which you can see here at six or seven days old. And so this egg stage predator, in this case, I showed you a snake, can affect the interactions between the tadpoles and their aquatic stage predators, which includes things like this dragonfly nymph or this predaceous water bug. And that is because we know that in many systems, not all prey are equally vulnerable to a given predator. And often the smallest, the youngest prey are more vulnerable to predators than are the largest prey. And that's not just true for tadpoles, that's true for many, many kinds of predator-prey interactions. And so you see this risk of being eaten by the predator is lower for large tadpoles than it is for small tadpoles. And so in order to understand predation rate, we not only need to understand the effects of density on predation, but also the effects of size. And another interesting thing that we need to think about with climate change issues is that if you hatch out small and the, the climate is warming, the rate at which you go from being a small tadpole to a large tadpole will actually increase. And so that can also affect predation rate over time. So what we needed to do was be able to come up with a way that, that accounts for all of these different variables that affect predation. And so again, we did an experiment where we manipulated prey availability, in this case, tadpoles. Here you can see going from a high density to a low density. And then we did that experiment with 
large, medium, and small tadpoles so that we could understand simultaneously how size and density were affecting predation. And here's just a plot of the outcome of that experiment. And we can see over on the left side of this figure, this is describing that functional response that we've been talking about. And the different symbol types are for different sized prey. And so you can see these largest uh, black triangles here at the bottom are for the largest prey, where the number of tadpoles killed was very low. And this top line here is for um, one of the smaller sized prey, where many more were killed. Now, this right-hand panel of this figure is the exact same data, but in this case, with size on our axis down here. So this is describing how size affected predation rate by the predator. And so out here, we have really large prey, which were hardly eaten at all by the predators, but intermediate size prey were the most attacked by the predators relative to even the earliest hatchling stage. So we got this hump-shaped effect of size. And in this particular study, it turned out size was a more important factor in predation rate than was density. And so what we were able to do with that is create a three-dimensional description of predation rate for these tadpoles with these predators. And so here we can see how tadpole density going in this direction affected predation rate, and then how tadpole size simultaneously affected predation rate across all possible size and densities of these tadpoles. And what this really led us to is that to realize is that we needed a new framework for studying predator-prey interactions, given these increasing complexities. And so the details of this equation are not important, but what we did are, and are doing are, is developing a new framework for functional responses that we call the generalized predator functional response. And the important parts of these equations is that we have a component here that allows us to uh, quantify uh, predation by uh, multiple predators that incorporates the effects of temperature and size on attack rate in an explicit way, like I showed you that three-dimensional figure. But it also allows us to incorporate changes in size that are due to growth, um, which are also affected by things like temperature. And so this allows us to look at predation through time, incorporating all of those factors that we know and I've shown affect predation rate. And so this is what that model looks like. So on, the, on this vertical axis here, we're just showing you the proportion of prey that survive an encounter with predator over time, moving along this axis. And you can see the center of this hump-shaped relationship is moving farther into the screen as we go through time. And that's because prey are increasing in size. And so this model allows us to capture all of those interacting pieces in a single framework to sort of understand predators. And in that case, allows us to make predictions about how changes in things like temperature might affect predation in natural systems. And so that brings me to the last thing I want to tell you about today, and that is, um, can we predict how things like global climate change will affect um, systems that are dependent upon predation? And for this, we needed a system that was conducive to applying our models. And this is work I just want to uh, acknowledge that I've been doing with a PhD student, Andy Davidson, and a collaborator of mine, James Vonish, at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And the system that we've been working in is this riverine rock pool system. And so along the fall line of many uh, states of the mid-Atlantic, you have these large granite outcroppings. And over thousands of years of water flowing over these granite uh, outcroppings, we had these small holes that were sort of bore into the granite surface. And you can see those here. And each one of these holes turns into a little uh, mini pond environment. These are my collaborators here sampling some of these ponds. And in fact, along uh, Richmond, Virginia, we've mapped out over 800 of these small uh, circular pools. And we've sampled the fauna in them over time uh, in, in each one of these cases and, and kept track of it. Now, it turns out in these pools, one of the primary, uh, one of the most abundant species is this mosquito, the North American rock pool mosquito, which is endemic to rock pools in the Atlantic. But it is also a suspected um, a vector 
for a variety of disease, including lacrosse encephalitis. And so uh, understanding what controls its populations can be really important for, um, for understanding vectors that are like mosquitoes. And then the system is also characterized by three really common predators. And these are three different species of dragonfly, a blue dasher uh, larval phase or nymph, a spot, a spot wing glider nymph, and um, a pond hawk. So what we needed to do was characterize the functional responses for these predators feeding on mosquitoes, and also how temperature would change those uh, interactions. And so here I'm showing you um, functional responses for each of those three dragonfly predators um, across different temperatures. And so here, uh, the blue being the coolest temperature and the red being the warmest temperature. And what we can see is that temperature affects the predation rate by these predators in different ways. They each have the same shape functional response, but the blue dasher was not very strongly affected by temperature. Its uh, predation rate, which you might expect to increase because temperature increases metabolic rate, only increased by about 35% across that large range in temperature. The spot wing, in contrast, increased by almost half. So it almost uh, half again increased its predation rate on mosquitoes as temperature increased. But this eastern pond hawk uh, really uh, was really affected by temperature and, and greatly increased its uh, consumption rate as temperatures warmed. And so it was more responsive to changes in the environment than these other two predators. So just keep that in mind as we move through the rest of this uh, presentation. Next, what we wanted to do was understand how these this gradient in temperatures, which was from about 20 degrees C to 30 to 6 degrees C, affected the mosquito themselves. And so in this case, how did it affect the development rate of mosquitoes, which like dragonflies have a complex life cycle where they're aquatic as larvae and then flying as adults. <clears throat> And what we found was that, as you might expect, the development time, so the amount of time it takes them to go from hatching out of their egg to metamorphosing into an adult mosquito, decreased as temperature increased. So they went through their developmental stages more rapidly and metamorphosed as adults um, in almost half the time at the highest temperature at 36 degrees <clears throat> relative to at 20 degrees. So it increases the transition from egg to adult in the mosquitoes, but it also affected their survival. And actually what we can see on this figure here is as temperature increased up to about 32 degrees C, there was really low mortality naturally in mosquitoes across that temperature range until we get to about 36. And this is because animals reach what's called their thermal maximum beyond which they're not able to physiologically adjust their internal um, homeostasis to deal with that high, high temperature. And so while they developed really fast at that temperature, many of them died because they were developing too quickly for their bodies to keep up. But across these lower temperatures, there was really no effect on mosquito survival. So now we had all the key pieces, right? We have how temperature affects the functional response of dragonflies. So, and we know it increased them to varying degrees as temperature increased. And we also know how temperature affected the growth or developmental rate of these mosquitoes. And again, as temperature increased, the developmental time decreased. So using that modeling framework, that generalized functional response framework I presented, we can incorporate all these things into a single model and ask, how does that change survival of mosquitoes in a warming environment. And this is where those differences in the responses of the predators to temperature come into play. We can see for the two species of dragonflies where the temperature did not affect their foraging rate to a great extent, uh, increasing temperatures actually increases the number of mosquitoes surviving in those ponds. So you get a net increase in mosquitoes when the temperature goes up because the predator's foraging rate isn't increasing to compensate for the faster developmental time. Whereas in the Eastern pond hawk, you get really no change across increasing temperatures. And again, it's because of that flexibility in their foraging rate, they're increasing their foraging rate at the same time that the developmental rates are increasing so they can balance out that 
effect of temperature. So these there's different implications of these changes um, on how that's going to affect their surviving predators. But lastly, we needed to say, can we do that in the field? So we went, again, I told you we've been surveying these pools. Um, and so we went out and collected data from these pools on the pool temperature and also on the number of mosquitoes and the species and number of predators. And we tried to see if uh, the predictions of our models were actually realized in this natural system. And here's just one of them of a lot of results to, to show you sort of the, the culmination. As you can see here in the blue dots were relatively cooler pools and the red dots were relatively hotter pools. And what we found is that when you add these predators to the cooler pools, you decrease the abundance of mosquitoes uh, successfully metamorphosing into adults by over 90%, right? So that's a huge reduction in the mosquito population. However, when conditions are warmer, that actually only decreased, adding the predators only decreased mosquitoes by 65%. Uh, so as a huge decrease, <clears throat> I mean, a huge impact on the ability of these predators to control mosquitoes because the temperature affected the mosquitoes to a greater extent than the predators. So it gave an increase in mosquito abundances across all these pool systems. So I think we're just about at the end of this. So I wanna give you a couple take home messages from my work. Um, one is I just want to, to reiterate that I think predators are fascinating for many reasons. And I think that fascination stems from both our intrinsic appreciation for the importance of predators uh, uh, and, and their role as consumers um, in ecosystems, as well as just because of the, the, the drama and the majesty of the predation events themselves. Also, um, I hope that you remember that predators play a key role in maintaining the stability of ecosystems, right? So predators, when you remove a predator, it has huge implications, not just on the predator itself, but on all the other sort of links in the food web that were regulated by that predation um, predator's presence. Also that by controlling prey populations, um, predators not only increase the productivity of ecosystems, they can also be really important in reducing the abundance of pest species. I talked a lot about mosquitoes, but this is true for like agricultural pests and, and lots of pests in general. Um, and so they're both for natural as well as for pest control. And finally, um, my approach to studying predators is really mechanistic. And I hope that I was able to relay that gaining a mechanistic understanding of predator prey interactions is really important for predicting how changes in the climate and also changes in predator diversity might impact ecosystems at multiple levels. And thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Mike. That was incredibly fascinating to hear it from all those different perspectives. Um, and we do have a question. So let me actually, it's a three-part question. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll read all three and then I can always go back to them. So the first part of the uh, questions is, will the tadpoles hatched prematurely due to predation event catch up to the others in size? Does it matter, i.e. do larger tadpoles have greater ability to thrive? That's the first part of the question. Uh, second part, to be clear, plastic lechates are the chemicals, neither nano or microplastics. And then are there early indications that plastic lechates do impact the brains for our magnificent octopus like the Daphnia in a 2017 study? So I can, I can, it's, it sounds like you might know this person, hopefully, <laughs> Carolyn Cost, but uh, maybe you could uh, speak to those questions. Yeah, so in the case of the tadpoles, um, they actually do not seem to undergo any compensatory growth in this particular system. Um, but there are other systems where premature hatching tadpoles have been shown to undergo compensatory growth. And I think uh, in this case, it seemed like just the differences in size uh, explain the differences in their survival. And so because those larger tadpoles hatch out at a more preferred size for the predators, they're eaten at a higher rate than the, and so they kind of, I think, take attention away from those smaller ones that are hatching and laying on the bottom. And so we were able to capture those effects by just incorporating size without any other uh, components of growth to predict that system. Um, for the second question about the leachates, um, 
it kind of depends on the source of the plastics. So a lot of plastics um, that are have been pulverized in natural degradation cycles to get to the stage of being a microplastic or an endoplastic have been in the environment for a sufficient amount of time that many of the leachates probably have already uh, been ex you know released from those plastics. Um, and a lot of experimental work with microplastics, those are fresh plastics and they do leach a variety of chemicals depending on the manufacturing process. Um, in our particular study with octopus, we were really interested in uh, an increasing documentation of octopuses uh, interacting with plastics, using them as dens or just you know playing with them in the natural environment. And there's been a few studies just looking at social media documenting the increased interaction between octopuses and plastics. And so um, that study was really motivated uh, by a study a couple of years ago that looked at how this particular leachate, oleamide or oleamide, um, affected hermit crab behavior. And so it turns out oleamide, when it's being broken down until its metabolites, mimics a chemical called oleic acid, which is released from uh, decaying shellfish. And so it triggered this foraging response in hermit crabs, among other things. And so we were really interested in maybe whether this chemical might be changing the foraging interaction, either by changing the prey's uh, amount of risk aversion or changing the octopus themselves. Um, and we do know that some of the biochemical pathways that that particular leachate works through are present in octopuses as well as humans and others. In fact, we produce oleomede in our brains when we're really sleepy. Um, so it's a natural product that you can buy on Amazon as a sleep aid, in fact. So um, I don't know if that answered all three questions, but I hope so. If not, ask again. <laughs> I think it I think it did. And I might have to look up oleomede myself. Who knows, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so another uh, question is, how can you transfer the maximum feeding rate you uh, you find for predators in an experimental setting to their natural habitat? Yeah, so that's a really great question and one that's a source of a lot of discussion and debate in, in the literature and, and in sort of application studies. Because when you do these functional response experiments, by necessity, you have to create a very controlled artificial environment. And so they don't have the same spatial extent and, you know, they can elevate those predation rates in some sense. And so um, I guess the short answer to that is, is that, you know, any experimental work we do in a controlled setting is really designed specifically to control the environment in ways that make the effect more uh, detectable than it would be in the noise of the natural world. And so that's a necessity of doing a lot of mechanistic science. But in terms of application, um, the idea is that those processes shouldn't scale quantitatively, but qualitatively in a lot of cases. So, for example, in that final study where we're trying to predict mosquito um, survival across that landscape of 800 pools, um, we're not predicting like specifically how many dragonflies will emerge from a given pool but we could predict the, the sort of general trend that we would expect there to be more dragonflies, I mean, more mosquitoes, um, given which species of dragonfly and what temperature it was. And so that's sort of where our predictions kind of come in is that we can say that there's gonna be uh, an effect in this direction or that direction um, and not necessarily to the exact number. That would be great, but that's a very much harder problem. Definitely, definitely. Uh, another question is, you know, in South Florida, um, what does it mean for invasive species, invasive species that that are now being part of the ecosystem, whether it be the pythons or iguanas that we're so used to seeing, or plant life too, like Brazilian peppers? I mean, how does some of the research that you've done translate to those in, in invasive species? Yeah, so um, work that I didn't decide to present today, but another sort of component of work that I'm, I have been doing that, you know, and there's a lot of people work doing relevant work here, but the generalized functional response framework, I have paired up with a, another approach that I've been developing to sort of model um, how changes in the diversity of predators will change the cascade of those predators on lower trophic levels. And so by pairing up that generalized functional response framework with something called functional diversity, 
which is a way of measuring um, uh, the diversity of different functional forms of predators in an environment, um, can be used to make quantitative predictions about how the introduction of a new predator or the extinction of a predator, which is the more common case in most of the world, um, will change the ecosystem. And Unfortunately, at the moment, we can't test those models in anything outside of an in silico environment because the, the data aren't there on the functional responses themselves because they can be quite um, large experiments to run to get the information needed to build those predictive models. But I will say, you know, sort of hopefully there are some new methods that we are employing in the lab that allow us to, to get those functional responses that we need, those parameters, um, using many, many fewer uh, experimental units. And so it's becoming more possible and for a, a wider array of organisms like the spotted eagle rays. Great. Um, another question came up. Can you speak to the dynamics and importance of apparent competition? So for those who, who aren't familiar with apparent competition, <clears throat> apparent competition is just the phenomena that if you have two organisms that are uh, share the same predator and you increase the abundance of one of them, you might see a decrease in the abundance of the other species. And so it's called a parent competition because in a competition experiment, if you increase the abundance of one competitor, it would negatively affect the other competitor. In this case, it negatively affects uh, the apparent competitor by increasing the abundance of its predator. And so those dynamics are really complicated, but it's something that often might be relevant for invasive species. Go back to that, because if you um, increase the abundance of one prey, say by fertilizing crops, right, it'll increase the reproductive rate of one insect. And um, that might then lead to an increase in the abundance of, say, a spider predator, which then will spill over and affect maybe some unrelated taxa by having a higher number of predators in the environment. And so, uh, yeah, as you add in more and more links and sort of shared uh, food web interactions, the ability to predict those outcomes become increasingly challenging, um, but super interesting, I would say. I'm not sure if that exactly answered the question, but. Um, well, and that might go into um, a similar question or a similar um, uh, looking for your commentary. Um, many people might be familiar with, depending on the age of the people listening, uh, regarding the gray wolf in Yellowstone uh, and regarding its reintroduction. So I'm wondering too, if that has anything to do with apparent competition, uh, wondering specifically in these, in these particular systems where you remove a predator and then all of a sudden these, these uh, things that happen afterwards, the elk coming in, uh, uh, in abundance and creating damage. Could you speak to maybe that reintroduction then? Yeah, so it's actually a really fascinating and very controversial topic. Um, there's been a lot of work in recent years. So in the beginning, I referred to that sort of effect of predators, which changes the behavior or where foraging animals choose to spend their time because they can smell the predators um, or see them or know that they're there. And so a lot of the changes that have happened in places like Yellowstone after the reintroduction of wolves are thought to be due to what they refer to as non-consumptive effects of predators. So there's effects that predators have that aren't associated with directly killing the, the prey species, but by changing their, their behavior to be foraging in different regions. Um, so in that system, um, I think it was the, the introduction of, of wolves caused uh, mule deer, um, I think it was, which are becoming really overabundant, not super familiar with the system, but one of the sort of large uh, herbivore. Um, I, think it was, I think it was elk. Elk, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, so they shifted the elks to feeding uh, in, in a different area, which changed the sort of grazing pressure on trees and sort of the grasses there. And it actually ended up changing erosion rates and lots of things that affected that system. Um, and there's definitely evidence that that happened. Um, where the controversy comes in is to, uh, to, you know, the role of other processes that we know have also happened in that system, like fires and things that had similar kinds of effects as those predators. And obviously, as with all controversies, the answer is both, but um, it's hard to tease apart the relative importance. But there are lots of examples of um, how the loss of a predator or the introduction of a predator can drastically change the structure of an ecosystem. 
probably one of the more classic ones is the inter the loss of uh, uh, sea otters from kelp forest in the Pacific Northwest. And sea otters graze on uh, eat uh, sea urchins among other things. But when sea urchins are really abundant, they graze them, they eat them, and control their populations. When the sea otters disappeared, sea urchin populations bloomed out of control, and it actually converts kelp forest into barren mudflats and sort of what's called a regime shift. Um, and this has been a very well documented scenario. You can see similar effects with the loss of sharks on coral reefs, um, and uh, even earthworms <laughs> have been shown to have large cascading effects on forest ecosystems in a similar way. Fascinating. Well, I think that was the last question. And uh, again, thank you so much for the presentation. This is very yeah, thank you very, for very, having me. Yeah, very very welcome. And. Uh, uh, wish you a, a great end of your semester, too. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.